Okay, can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn uh, while moving around the chamber or around the Holyrood campus? The next item of business is a debate on motion 1803 in the name of John Swinney on COVID recovery strategy. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the, um, the motion for around 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 5th of October, I set out to Parliament the Scottish Government's COVID recovery strategy. The strategy sets out the Government's vision for recovery and our commitment to supporting those most affected during the pandemic. I very much hope that members across the Chamber will support the strategy and the wider efforts of this Government to bring about a fairer future for the people of Scotland. As we look towards an uncertain and challenging winter period ahead, it is clear that the pandemic is not yet over. We must all continue to take the appropriate steps to keep ourselves, our loved ones and our communities safe. I warmly thank all those who are continuing to play their part to protect Scotland. However, because of the measures we have taken to control the virus and the incredible success of the vaccination programme, life for many will feel much more normal than it has done for quite some time. As a consequence, while we continue to focus on responding to the pandemic, the Government is able to take the necessary steps to support and to enable a fair recovery from the pandemic. Presiding officer, today I will set out how the COVID recovery strategy will bring about that fairer future, particularly for those most impacted during the pandemic. As I set out in my previous statement, the pandemic has dramatically affected every aspect of our lives. The Government has asked people to change where and how they worked, conducted business and socialised with friends and family. While the past 18 months have taken a significant toll on people across the country, there have been positive examples of collaborative working and people solving problems in creative and imaginative ways in all of the communities that we all have the privilege to represent. Alongside addressing the harms of the pandemic, the Government will learn and build on the positives that have emerged from the pandemic. While it is true that the pandemic has affected all of us and required much sacrifice from many, it is not the case that all have been impacted equally. The pandemic has highlighted and worsened inequalities across our country, and for many, the past 18 months have been incredibly challenging. People who were disadvantaged before the pandemic have been hardest hit during the pandemic. These individuals, our neighbours, friends and constituents, were more likely to become seriously ill and sadly to die from COVID, and they were the hardest hit socially and economically as a result of the necessary restrictions introduced to control the spread of the virus. People living in low-income households have been able to save less, have taken on more debt and have been significantly impacted by labour market pressures. Our children and young people have been affected through school closures and uncertainty about their learning, training and employment. We know also that many unpaid carers have faced added pressure during the pandemic and it has been an incredibly difficult time for them. We are in regular touch with carer representatives, including Carers Scotland, to make sure we understand carers' concerns and can act accordingly. We have invested an additional £28.5 million for local carer support in this year's budget, bringing total investment in the Carers Act to £68 million per year. The pandemic has also resulted in an unprecedented shock to Scotland's economy and job market, and existing job market inequalities have been exacerbated, with Brexit reinforcing these inequalities. We, uh, of course, Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. One of my concerns is that people look at the increase in vacancies and think there are no employment issues. But does he acknowledge that it is possible to have both increasing unemployment and increasing vacancies because there is not an efficient uh, 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 interaction between those two factors? Uh, Cabinet I, Secretary, I, I, and I, can, I can say we have got quite a bit of time in hand this afternoon, um, so you will be uh, reimbursed for your time. Thank you, President Officer. I, I agree wholeheartedly with Mr Johnson, and I think he makes a substantial point, which poses a challenge to government and to a variety of institutions around the country to make sure that the interventions we put in place can directly address satisfactorily the challenge that he puts, that there are vacancies in the labour market. He will be speaking to businesses in his constituency, as I am to in my own and also around the country, who are facing real challenges about vacancies. But equally, 
there will be individuals who will be unemployed. Mr Fraser and I discussed this issue question time in uh, portfolio questions yesterday. Um, people who are unemployed, some people may be furloughed, their jobs may come to an end, but they may not be ideally skilled to move into another sector. So our colleges, our institutions, our training interventions, the Young Persons Guarantee, the Transition Training Fund, these all must be efficient and focused to address the issue that Mr Johnson fairly puts to me. And I give him the assurance that the government is constantly addressing those questions. In addition to that, we must also focus, and this is a point I made to Mr Fraser yesterday, on people who are economically inactive in our society currently, who with appropriate levels of support, assistance, perhaps additional public services, they can be assisted to enter the labour market, the health secretary, has uh, regularly raised his concerns about the availability of the social care workforce, which is critical to ensuring the uh, demand for um, uh, care packages in our community is satisfactorily delivered, uh, a point I discussed with Jackie Bailey in Parliament in question time yesterday. Um, we potentially can enable some of those individuals who are economically inactive to gain access to the labour market with the proper support that they require. Indeed, ministers were wrestling yesterday with some of the practical issues around wraparound childcare, which I recognise to be a significant issue. The um, minister who will close the debate will uh, talk about some of the issues about housing supply, which are material to making sure that individuals can find the stability to enable them to enter the labour market. So, Mr Johnson makes a very fair point. Uh, of course, okay, we can... Alex Rowley. I am grateful to Mr Swinney. I recently visited the Ratlock Centre in Stirling. Um, directly funded through the Scottish Government, a brilliant project that is trying to reach those people that are most further away from the labour market. How do we start to ensure that we get more funding going directly into community organisations that are able to deliver the kind of successes that we are seeing from the Rathlock Centre? Cabinet Secretary. I think Mr Rowley puts his finger on an important point, because the, the Rathlock example that he highlights is a, is a perfect example of exactly the point I've tried to make to, 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 to Mr Johnson. Um, but I would also acknowledge that Rathlock-style centres don't exist in every part of the country. So we have to make sure that best practice is shared around the country, um, that we are encouraging uh, different institutions and community planning partnerships at local level to adopt these techniques because the Rathlock Centre model is one which clearly assists individuals to enter the labour market with the necessary support. So it's an initiative that I commend and I give them the assurance that as part of the wider COVID recovery strategy, we're trying to make sure that more of those interventions are available around the country to support individuals. So, President Officer, we cannot return to uh, how things were before the pandemic when some people, because of their income, their health, their disability, their race or their gender, were less secure and less able to protect themselves and their families from circumstances beyond their control. Our recovery from the pandemic must be focused on creating a fairer future for everyone. It is critical that we deliver the type of recovery that people want and need. During the summer, the government heard from people that they wanted the recovery that addresses the harms caused by the pandemic, supports health and well-being, and supports economic development and provides financial security. The government has listened to the valuable messages that have been shared through the Citizens' Assembly of Scotland and the Social Renewal Advisory Board. I'm grateful to all who have shared their views and experiences so openly and honestly. The message is clear. The people of Scotland want a fairer future for all of our uh, fellow uh, members of our community. This message is central to the COVID recovery strategy and the strategy has a clear vision that will bring about a fairer future. We will address the inequalities made worse by COVID. We will make progress towards a wellbeing economy where our success is based on more than uh, GDP and accelerate inclusive person-centred public services. The strategy details three outcomes that are central to achieving this vision of a fairer future. These are to increase financial security for low-income households, enhance the well-being of children and young people, and to create good green jobs and fair work. These three outcomes are supported by an overarching ambition to rebuild public services, ensuring that they are person-centred in design and delivery, which is very much the point that Mr Rowley was making to me about the work, the approach that is taken at the Raploch Centre. There are already examples of public services being delivered in this way, and the Government's ambition is that every person in Scotland is able to access and benefit from public services in a way that meets their individual needs. 
a renewed and enhanced collaboration and partnership with local government, with business organisations and the third sector will be critical to achieving our vision. We must build on the spirit of collaboration, urgency and flexibility that characterised our collective response to the pandemic. The challenge that I have put to government and that we are sharing with our colleagues in local government and business organisations and the third sector and our communities is if we can move so fast collectively and collaboratively to tackle a pandemic that was a direct threat to the, life, the lives and livelihoods of all of us in March 2020, then surely we can deploy the same energy and focus to ensure that in the tackling of poverty in our society and in the delivery of, uh, of a fairer future, we can deploy the same collaborative energy to ensure that that can be done. The COVID recovery strategy details how the government will work with partners to prioritise, coordinate and target actions most effectively over the um, next 18 months to meet the needs of the most affected during the pandemic. To ensure financial security for low-income families, we will roll out the Scottish Child Payment to children under 16 by the end of next year and double the payment to £20 a week per child as soon as possible in this Parliament. We will also commence work to expand funded early learning and childcare to children aged one and two and design a wraparound childcare whereby the least well-off families will pay nothing. And that perhaps can address some of the issues that Mr Johnson raised with me about supporting people into the labour market. To further reduce the cost of the school day, we will expand provision of free breakfasts and lunches and increase the school clothing grant each year. To enhance the well-being of our children and young people, we will invest at least £500 million over this Parliament to create a whole family well-being fund. This fund will provide universal and holistic support services that will be available in communities across Scotland, giving families access to the help that they need where and when they need it. We will also deliver our Young Persons Guarantee by providing up to £70 million this year so that every person aged between 16 and 24 has the opportunity to study, take up an apprenticeship, employment or work experience. This will include targeted measures to support care experienced young people, disabled young people and those from low socio-economic groups. The Government will also provide £120 million of further funding through the Mental Health Recovery and Renewal Fund, which includes increased support for child and adolescent mental health services. To create good green jobs and fair work, we will support the creation of more jobs through the Green Jobs Fund and the Green Jobs Workforce Academy. The forthcoming 10-year National Strategy for Economic Transformation will set out plans for strengthening Scotland's economy, recognising that a strong and sustainable economy goes hand-in-hand hand with a fair and equal society. We will uh, of course. Pam Duncan Glancy. Um, thank you, um, Deputy President Officer and Deputy First Minister. The, the point you make about a strong, sustainable economy is a really important one, I think, as we come out of the pandemic. The, the third sector um, employs and makes a, about the same contribution um, in terms of employment and economics to, to the, the countries, the NHS. On that basis, would you include the third sector, given what we've seen they've been able to do at short notice and, and uh, under pressure in the last year, would you include them in the next Scottish Government economic strategy? Cabinet Secretary, if you could begin winding up reasonably soon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, 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 yes is the short answer to Pam Duncan Glancy, because I'm struck by the opportunities. I was just looking at some material on this the other day from some of our social enterprise organisations, for example, where some of the ideas there might be able to assist in the challenge of expanding the social care workforce that the Health Secretary has been, uh, has been uh, clearly actively focused on addressing. Uh, because of the reach of some of these organisations into our communities, delivering locally based employment, which perhaps saves transport costs for individuals. So, that, uh, so I, I very much welcome that. I've just agreed to meet with um, a social Investment Scotland and Social Enterprise Scotland to continue some of the discussions that I greatly enjoyed with them when I was the Finance Secretary uh, to establish just how they can contribute to the COVID recovery strategy. So uh, I look forward to those discussions. Um, in drawing my remarks to a close, Presiding Officer, I, I would make one final point. This strategy um, must be viewed as a national effort. It therefore requires collaboration. And I have signalled in the strategy the willingness of the government to work closely with our local authority partners. We intend to establish a joint oversight board with local government 
to share in the implementation and application of this strategy, not in any form of top-down approach, but by, by engagement, collaboration, involving the third sector, involving the private sector, to make sure that we put as much effort into tackling poverty and delivering a fair future as we put into tackling a pandemic that was a threat to the lives of all of us. And with those remarks, uh, Presiding Officer, I move the motion in my name and I encourage Parliament to support the Government's COVID recovery strategy. Thank you very much indeed, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, before calling our next speaker, could I ask all those who are intending to speak in this debate to press their uh, request to speak buttons uh, now or as soon as possible? And I call on Murdo Fraser to speak to and move Amendment 1803.2 for around seven minutes, Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. When the Scottish Government publishes a new strategy, the first question to ask always is, what is new here? And the answer to that question in this case is, not a lot. We do have an extensive document running to 47 pages. There's a lot of re-announcements of existing policies, but very little in this document is actually new. Nor is there much in the way of timescales for delivery of many of the initiatives that are announced or have been re-announced. What should unite us in this chamber is a shared ambition that we do see COVID recovery as quickly and comprehensively as possible. And in that respect, I have very little that I would disagree with a lot of what the Deputy First Minister has just said. But I want to focus on two key areas this afternoon where I think more needs to be done by the Scottish Government, and that as a matter of urgency. And the first area relates to the situation in the NHS, and this is covered, of course, in the strategy document. We have long argued, it is now well understood and agreed, that the best route out of the current pandemic is through the vaccination programme. That is why it has been so important, and its success up to now has been instrumental in allowing us to make progress and relax restrictions. And yet, it is undeniable that we are now seeing challenges with the vaccination programme. We learned this week that more than 100,000 people who should be now receiving their booster jag are still waiting. Yet these boosters are essential, particularly in reassuring the older population that they are safe. Indeed, we heard earlier in the uh, chamber at First Minister's question some examples uh, of the situation that is happening on the ground. We heard that in the COVID Recovery Committee this morning as well, examples of older people expecting to get the booster jag and very concerned that this has not yet been forthcoming. Um, today we learned from NHS Fife that one-fifth of those living uh, in that area, which I represent, one-fifth of those eligible for boosters and flu vaccine aged over 80 have still to receive an appointment. And that's a stark illustration of the point that I am making. Older people are worried. They've been told that they need to get this booster to give them that crucial extra protection over the winter months, and they're still waiting to hear when they will get one. And that needs to be the focus of attention for this government. And that's only one aspect of the wider issues affecting the NHS. We are, I think it is now well understood, at a crisis point within the NHS in Scotland, with hospitals bursting at the seams and record waits at accident and emergency departments. Again, we heard this week shocking statistics showing that there is now a wait, in some cases, of up to 40 hours at some hospitals for A&E admissions. Just this week, NHS Lothian were telling people not to attend A&E unless their condition was life threatening. Now, I think that's a really concerning line for the NHS to be putting out to the general public. How is any individual with a serious injury or with sudden chest pains supposed to know if they are facing, uh, what they are facing falls in the category of being life-threatening? There's a real danger that lives could be lost as a result of that sort of messaging. If an elderly person falls over and breaks their ankle, their life might not be at risk, but clearly they're in a lot of distress. What are they then supposed to do? They meant, not meant then, not meant then to call an ambulance or try and attend an accident and emergency. Uh, yes, I'll happily give way. John Mason. I, th I thank the member for giving way. I mean, the other side to this is: Would you accept that in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, 32 per cent of those turning up at A&E were reckoned to have minor ailments? So there is a bit of space for people not going to A&E. Murdo Fraser. I think, I think, I mean, I, I don't disagree with, with, with the statistic the member has quoted. I'm sure it's accurate. The danger is if we're effectively asking people through an NHS board, uh, through a public message, to self-diagnose, I think that's really concerning. Because I think there's a real risk that people who are actually facing uh, a, a very serious injury or something life-threatening don't then attend the A&E. I think we need to be very careful that that message 
I see Christine Graham rising. I'll give way to her if I have time. Yeah. Very Christine brief, Graham. Just very briefly, and it isn't the be-all and end-all, I accept that, but the Scottish Ambulance Service has helpfully put on its website guidance as to where to call if you have certain injuries. And I'm not talking about, you know, saying don't ever call an ambulance, but there is some guidance. So if people are in doubt, they can check, and it directs them to other services if necessary. Fraser, I think again, you again, again, I thank Christian Graham for that intervention. I think the difficulty with all this is often people will only see one message. So they see a message on social media, in this case from NHS Lothian, that said to people, do not attend A&E unless your condition is life-threatening. And that's all they see. And that is really concerning. And that is somewhere I think the government needs to be very clear about the message that's sending out to people. Because we will end up with people in much worse uh, health situations than otherwise would be the case, and lives might be lost. Yeah, well, if I have time... Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm grateful to, to Mr Fraser for giving me, because th there, there is a substantial issue here where I hope he understands that the government and health boards have to say to people that, uh, that, that there must be good and appropriate reason for individuals to use accident and emergency. It's not called accident and emergency departments for any casual reason. It's if people have had an accident or it is an emergency. And there are many other aspects of health care available. So I, I would encourage Mr Fraser to take a considered view about the, which is the point that both Christine Graham and John Mason have been making, as to the judgments people should make about seeking the appropriate health care for the circumstances and difficulties they face. Murdo Fraser. Well, well I, you know, I, I say to Mr Swinney, you know, I, I think that message is to be given to health boards like NHS Lothian, who are putting out messages to people saying, do not attend A&E unless your condition is life threatening. How are the public supposed to know what is a life-threatening situation? If somebody has chest pain, if somebody thinks they might have the symptoms of a stroke, if somebody has a serious injury, how do you know if it's life-threatening? And that, I think, is, is a message uh, the government needs to take away. Now, I've taken out a lot of time on this, uh, presiding officer. I want to move on to talk about another important issue, which is in relation to the economy and specifically support for business. Because throughout the lockdown, we saw generous financial support to the business community, to the self-employed and to workers through the furlough scheme and other initiatives. We also saw extensive grant support now mostly coming to an end as the economy recovers and businesses are allowed to reopen. But there are still sectors of the economy under pressure. The introduction of the vaccine passport scheme, unique in Scotland and like, unlike any other part of Europe, it does not allow a negative COVID test as an alternative to a vaccine passport as the price of entry, is having a negative impact on the nighttime industry. According to the Scottish Hospitality Group this week, turnover is down in some premises by 40% following the introduction of the vaccine passport scheme, and there have been reports of a growing level of abuse towards door staff, some of whom are walking off the job as a result. Well, I've, I've taken three interventions. Mr. Fairley will forgive me, and I need to make some progress. Um, I've made the case on numerous previous occasions to the Scottish Government that if they want to have a vaccine passport scheme, they need to offer the alternative of a negative test. And if they're not going to do that, we're, we will continue to see a negative and substantial economic impact on businesses, businesses who have already been suffering due to 18 months of restrictions and closures, and then the Government need to be stepping up with financial compensation. Yesterday in the budget, the Chancellor announced an extension of rates relief for businesses in the retail, hospitality and leisure sector at the rate of 50% for a further year across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, and yesterday, the Scottish Tourism Alliance called on the Scottish Government to follow suit, and I hope that they will. But we also need to look at how those businesses directly affected by the vaccine passport scheme uh, might be also supported. And there's a need to go beyond this in terms of wider support for economic recovery. I was surprised that in the 47 pages of the recovery document, there is not one mention of the Scottish National Investment Bank, a flagship policy announced to assist with sustainable economic growth and now seemingly slipping down the radar. It is all too reminiscent of the much vaunted public energy company launched once with great fanfare and then delivering nothing. So what is the role of SNIB in relation to COVID recovery? Should it not be there to address market failures in the provision of finance to all types of enterprises which deliver beneficial outcomes for the public good and for COVID recovery. For example, I've been engaging with the Growth Partnership, who are promoting social impact bonds, an innovative and imaginative initiative delivering real benefits for the public sector and helping progress towards a well-being economy, and yet struggling to attract commercial support. 
Groups in this sphere could benefit substantially from support from SNP, but at present it is unclear whether SNP has a role in providing that level of support. So that is one clear area where this strategy is currently lacking and where it could be improved. And in his remarks earlier, the Cabinet Secretary talked a lot uh, about the role of the third sector in, in reply to uh, an intervention uh, from the, the Labour benches. He made very clear he prized the third sector. Here is a very good example of a third sector initiative that could help with COVID recovery, currently cannot because it is not getting the support and it could be getting support from SNP. And I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will look into that. Presiding officer, I am well over my time, I think. Uh, just to conclude, uh, where there is very little in this strategy we would object to, overall it fails to meet the challenge before us and particularly the immediate pressures that face our NHS and our economy. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Fraser. I now call on Daniel Johnson to speak to and move Amendment 1803.1 for around five minutes, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In 2016, within weeks of the election, the newly appointed Education Secretary published a plan for education which set out a number of detailed milestones backed by detailed analysis of where we needed to improve our schools. Five years on, we have the, the same minister now in charge of COVID recovery, a job in every way more important, more urgent, more profound. Yet the plan took months to publish, and in my view, and the, of these of these benches, less specific and in some ways less ambitious. And in many, as uh, Mr Fraser pointed out, of the initiatives contained within it are simply repeats, not just from the election, but before the election. And I say this because I profoundly believe that Mr Swinney is a serious politician and this is a serious mission that he has been charged with. But by his own yardstick, I don't believe this plan is uh, 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 ambitious enough nor it contains the detail that I think recovery requires. Furthermore, I don't believe we have the recovery plans within portfolio areas of sufficient detail. What we have had so far is an education recovery plan that seems to commit to little more than glacial implementation of the OECD report and a health recovery plan that is already in tatters. What we need is a recovery plan that reflects the time that recovery will take and the ambitious, ambition that is required and the complexity uh, of the potentially permanent impact COVID has wrought on Scotland. That is fundamentally what our amendment seeks to do because uh, like the Conservative benches, we don't fundamentally disagree with the COVID recovery strategy that's set out, but it doesn't go far enough, doesn't have the concrete milestones or the concrete analysis. And that is what is required if we're going to recover from the consequences of the pandemic. And without those specific actions, targeted actions set out, I feel that the government motion is largely meaningless. So there are three elements in terms of our I'm happy to, Mrs. Thompson. Michelle Thompson. Um, however, I, I mean, I'm sure the member would recognise that the Scottish Government is fatally uh, constricted by not having borrowing powers. When we're talking about a crisis such as this, not being able to borrow to grow the economy is utterly fundamental. Will he therefore join me in asking the UK Government to grant that? Daniel Johnson. What I would say to Ms Thompson, but even by the standards of our own government, the plan does not go far or it contains the, the same level of ambition as the one set out for education in the previous parliament. Now, we have the budget coming up in a matter of weeks, the, the processes around uh, the fiscal framework, and I'm happy to have those debates, but there, there, is, a, 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 there is scope within uh, the envelope of the current government to go further. There are funds announced in the budget just yesterday which have yet to be allocated and I think there's sufficient scope to go much, much further and be much more ambitious than the plan set out uh, by the government. So let me set out three elements that we would uh, seek to go further. First of all, as uh, uh, suggested in our amendment, we do need to do much more to contain and suppress the virus. Through the autumn, Scotland had one of the highest infection rates throughout the whole of Europe. And we must stop using the benchmark of the hopeless Conservative government in Westminster because we know what works and we should be comparing ourselves to what other countries have been doing, such as Germany, 
who has had an excess death rate roughly half that of Scotland because they properly invested in testing and track and trace. So we must contain the virus by resourcing those, uh, those uh, systems to stop the virus in its tracks. Likewise, the vaccination programme has done an amazing job, but we must now redouble our efforts to complete it, taking jabs to where people are in schools, colleges and universities. And most importantly, and as already alluded to by Mr Fraser, we must recognise the severe challenges and issues in the booster uh, programme and the flu vaccination programme. I have constituents vaccinated more than six months ago who have no idea when their booster is meant to take place. And likewise, constituents are being asked to make two-hour round trips to get their flu shots. That, quite simply, is not only not good enough, but is failing to learn the lessons of the vaccination programme in the first instance. Secondly, uh, 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 we, we must address uh, the issues faced more broadly in our public services, because they are on the front line of dealing with the pandemic and are on the front line for delivering that recovery. But the challenges faced by the health service are profound. And we know, as has been pointed out by Lothian Health Board and from other areas, that this is being exacerbated by a lack of capacity. And that is why, in our amendment, we have put forward the, 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 the call for a plan for £15 per hour for care workers, raising their pay immediately to £12 an hour and working towards, in the fullness of time, and in, rather in short order, uh, to that £15 an hour mark. That would boost recruitment, improve pay, secure conditions of care workers. It is a disgrace that those who are doing such an important job are being paid little more than pennies above the minimum wage. And thirdly, it's important to uh, realise the economic impacts of the pandemic. They are complicated, as I already stated in my intervention. That we can have both vacancies and unemployment. Indeed, there were 93,900 people still on furlough when the scheme ended. And yet, the programmes already announced by the government in terms of reskilling and retraining barely address uh, a little more than a third of those people. We need to literally double our efforts to reskill and redeploy people. Entire sectors have changed permanently. Those people and those industries need action from government transition. And that is why we need to increase our provision for job creation schemes and retraining. Presiding officer, we need to stop name-checking recovery and start taking steps to deliver it. We need a clear analysis of what recovery requires, clear targets to track our progress, and a defined timetable for delivery. We need a recovery that focuses on jobs and a recovery that reinforces our public services. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. I now call on Beatrice Wishart for around four minutes. Ms Wishart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We must put the recovery from COVID first. The pandemic's disrupted everything. Schools, shopping, weddings and Parliament. It's highlighted great existing divides in our society and it's made these divides worse. Worse yet, almost 10,000 Scots have lost their lives, leaving behind grieving families and broken friends. For some of us, it's hard to imagine the feeling of losing someone close due to COVID. For others among us, it is a reality. My constituents are still contacting me with long COVID symptoms and queries, still asking for financial assistance, given the impact on their business, still facing restrictions which impact their finances and entitlements as they travel to the mainland. And here, if I may, I'll make a plea for an island-proofed recovery. Throughout the pandemic, there's been frustration that island needs have appeared to be an afterthought in some Scottish Government decision-making processes. Announcements made with a wealth of detail about restrictions affecting central belt communities often fail to include any mention of important differences for island communities working under different rules. And this created confusion. As we look ahead to dealing with the impacts of the pandemic and shaping the recovery, it's important that the work fully reflects the island's dimension too. We must make the country into a place which is unrecognisable from where we are. We need to repair the damage to our economy, communities and public services. A focus on jobs, mental health, our NHS, schools, the climate crisis. A liberal country where every individual is able to achieve their potential. 
As others have said, we've seen great uptake in the COVID vaccine programme in Scotland and across the UK, but we can't be complacent. Having the vaccine does not mean you can't catch and spread COVID. And COVID has had a significant impact on young people. Schools closed, qualifications disrupted, job prospects shattered, university, an exciting prospect, turned into hotspot chaos, endless isolation and classes online. We must work hard to ensure the COVID generation are not stuck with that label as an unfortunate description of lives forever impacted. Recovery doesn't have to look like anything in the past. There's been time to think about what we want, time to assess what would be better, time to invest in ourselves. So let's invest in each other as well. Investing in mental health treatment provision to be comparable with physical health treatment. Investing in an education bounce back to allow the next generation to step forward. Investing in our public services and thanking our, thanking our frontline workers for all that they've done. Deputy Presiding Officer, we have shown what we can do when we all pull together. We stayed at home, we clapped in the street, but let us not lose that sense of community and common purpose. Let us make the next decade and beyond be about not only what unites us, but what makes lives better and fairer. Let's put the recovery first. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. We'll now move to the uh, open part of the debate, and I call on John Mason to be followed by Liz Smith. Out to four minutes, please, Mr. Mason. Hey, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. The last 19 months have been difficult for everyone, but for some people, they have been extremely difficult. It seems clear that certain groups in society suffered much more during COVID than others did. And generally, these were people who were already disadvantaged in different ways already. For example, the financially wet, less well-off women, ethnic minorities, just being a few. As we seek to recover from COVID, we have the opportunity to do things differently. And I personally very much want to see a fairer society going forward. And most of us would probably say that we want that as well. However, I think the question remains eh, as to whether the majority of people throughout Scottish society are willing to pay the price there may have to be for that. During COVID, people were willing to make a lot of sacrifices. They did not go on foreign holidays, they did not go out for meals, they did not shop as much, meet friends, family, work colleagues, because they understood we faced an emergency. The question now is whether people are also willing to make these kind of changes to their lifestyles longer term. For example, eh, to accept fewer foreign holidays or not buying so many clothes for the good of the environment. And changes might also be required in order that income and wealth gets shared around more equitably. Maybe some of us who are well paid, like all of us in here, need to make do with a bit less in the next few years in order that those with less can get a fairer deal. There are still many things we do not know about the future. Will all the office workers go back to the city centres? Or will they be working partly or entirely at home? The answer to that could mean that we need fewer shops and restaurants in our towns and city centres for these office workers. And we might need fewer commuter trains to take them there and back. Yesterday we had the UK budget and the Chancellor certainly seemed upbeat. And it is good that forecast unemployment seems to be lower and the economic recovery seems to be coming faster than many of us had expected less than a year ago. Inflation remains a concern as it has been rising, and we need to see if this is a temporary blip or if it is going to be longer lasting. We don't really know yet. My own gut instinct is that money is going to be tight in the next few years. We have already seen that Glasgow Council and Glasgow Life have lost a considerable amount of income because of the pandemic and so cannot afford to reopen all the services they previously had. And with railways, passenger numbers are still well down, meaning the budgeted income is just not there. If I've got time, I'll take a quick intervention. Brief yes. intervention. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, Deputy Presiding Officer. W would you accept that Glasgow Life has also made representations to the First Minister and to the Scottish Government asking for more money so that it can open the remaining libraries, for example, and make sure that it can reopen all the remaining services in Glasgow, and that so far they've not been given that? 
John Mason. I accept that a lot of sectors, and that certainly includes Glasgow Council, probably all other councils in Scotland, Glasgow Life, the railways, have all and are all needing more money, as is the NHS. This is what I'm just going on to as well, eh, to catch up with its backlog. And, I mean, it's great that we've got a bit more money from yesterday's budget, but it will still be limited. And we are going to have to choose priorities over the coming years. As I was just saying with the railways, eh, the, their income is well down, passengers still only about 50 per cent. Eh, the Scottish Government cannot plug all of those gaps. It just is not possible. And I think we're all sympathetic to those who have worked extra hard during the pandemic, put themselves at risk. Eh, and of course, we would say many people deserve a pay increase in the NHS, local government, eh, the public transport and so on. But the question still is, where is the money to come for all this? And as I said, the NHS has a backlog um, and other sectors are probably going to need support for longer as tourism uh, and, and others take longer to get back to full strength. So we're going to have to choose priorities in the coming years and there are going to be some difficult decisions to make. I mean, another question I would have is, should the aviation sector return to where it was before and, and keep growing? Or should we accept that in the longer term it should remain smaller? Immigration or the lack of it is a problem for Scotland. It's hard to grow the economy if the population is not increasing. And that's been a challenge for many years, not just because of COVID, but the EU leaving the EU has made it worse. So overall, I do think we face many challenges in the coming few years. Some people do want to go back to things the way they were before because they were doing very nicely. However, I for one do not want a repeat of the past and I do want to see a fairer and more inclusive society and I believe we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I now call on Liz Smith to be followed by Christine Graham. Up to four minutes, please, Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you. The Deputy First Minister, Murdo Fraser and Daniel Johnson all said in their opening remarks that the key priority has to be on minimising the COVID threat and addressing the many other health issues that are arising from it. And that is absolutely right. But I am just as certain as ever that the second priority of the public and indeed the Scottish business sector is to ensure that we have a strong economic recovery, one that's sustainable in the future, not just in the short term. Um, and we have to be mindful that the predictions are showing that growth rates may well slow in that future. Now, the good news is, as we saw from yesterday's uh, budget, that the economic forecasts on growth just now are very much better than was previously thought might be the case. But of course, just as the Chancellor said yesterday, that needs to be set against the inflationary pressures, the rise in the cost of living and the rise in national insurance charges, even if these are generally accepted, uh, that they have a part to play in, ad in addressing the huge issue in health and social care spending. Because these inflationary pressures are strong. You only have to look at the petrol prices over the last 10 days to recognise just how strong they are. So growth is absolutely critical, not just for jobs and investment and obviously tax revenues, but also to encourage greater economic optimism. And of course, one thing that would immediately provide some optimism is for the Scottish Government to continue to provide business rates relief for the retail and hospitality sector for the longer period of time. The Scottish Government was very generous in uh, the last financial year, but it would be very good, Deputy First Minister, if we could hear what it intends to do now. Because the overwhelming message from the retail and hospitality sector, uh, and obviously from some of the witnesses that we've had at the Finance Committee, is that business continues to need very considerable support. Scottish Retail Consortium tells us that footfall is still 20% below the pre-pandemic level and that serious questions remain about the viability of some businesses, many of which have incurred substantial debt burdens and obviously uh, a, a difficult time for them, whether they will actually continue in the future. So that's why the Scottish Government's business waiver was very much welcomed, but it is something that I would urge them uh, to concentrate on uh, for the immediate future, because I think it is something that business is crying out for. We've also been told by several key stakeholders that much more has to be done to stimulate local economies which of course is the main reason why yesterday we had the levelling up programme and it was very good to see more details about this uh, coming forward yesterday and it was also very good, at, may I say, uh, to hear Kate Forbes on the radio this morning uh, welcoming uh, that funding because this parliament uh, may be very united in its support for uh, schemes like Scotland Loves Local but for local economies to be truly successful then I think a lot more has to be done. So I think it's why these benches are persistently arguing for much more uh, to be done to encourage our schools, our hospitals, other public bodies to procure much more local produce. 
And I think it was very interesting in yesterday's um, higher education rankings, which perhaps were interesting for their usual reasons, but they were actually very interesting because they were looking at the well-being uh, a lot of the aspects of some of our uh, universities. And it was very good to see two Scottish universities uh, very high up the tables about improving local procurement. So I think there's lots of lessons to be learned there. Of course, one of the biggest issues is very much about labour. Unemployment has not risen in the way that it was expected, and job vacancies are obviously continuing to be very high, but that tells us that there is a mismatch of skills and some problems about flexibility in the labour force. So I'm interested to hear what the uh, Deputy First Minister was saying about education and skills. He's absolutely right, but I think we need to know a much greater detail and much greater timing as to exactly what we're going to do, uh, because that is a crucial issue. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think the, the real critical uh, issue is about the provision of greater certainty and stability, and I use these words because they're the words that Kate Forbes uh, said, uh, when it comes to economic policy making, to a much more coherent and holistic approach to that policy making, and ensuring that Scotland remains fully competitive with other economies, most especially England, uh, because we know from last week's export statistics just how that is so important. The Scottish Government, as it knows, was recently criticised for not listening sufficiently well to business, whether that was about the broad scope of economic policy, the difficulties with vaccine passports, Ms. Smith, or, or, or being able to please. access available support. That criticism focused on the weaknesses of detail, and that's one of the reasons why we're focusing on our particular amendment this afternoon about that detail policy timescales and some of the contradictions within COVID policy. Thank you. Can I just say to members that actually we had a bit of time in hand and we've almost got no time in hand and if you take interventions which is entirely up to members then it will need to be absorbed within the members speech. I next call Christine Graham to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Up to four minutes please Ms Graham. Uh, thank you presiding officer. I refer to two planks of the COVID recovery strategy. One addressing the systemic inequalities made worse by COVID and the progress towards a well-being economy. These go hand in hand in a socially just society from cradle to grave. Some policies are already in train. I applaud the focus on early years with substantial investment for learning in the broader sense, including uh, free school meals. I applaud the £100 minimum grant for families for school clothing. That will help 120,000 families. And the fact that no Scottish student pays tuition fees in comparison to England, where there are at least 9,000 per annum and for the elderly free, school, uh, free personal care. And as we are propelled by COVID into a national care service, which we know will not be easy, but the integration of health and social care was not easy, and, but it is a target we must aim for. However, it's the term wellbeing economy I wish to consider and ask rhetorically, what does that mean? Is it regenerative development, a circular economy, economy for the common good? I rather prefer the latter, which must also be for the good of the planet. Now, of course, we do need to generate revenue to fuel government policies and initiatives. But the question is, what matters is how do we do it and for whose benefit and what is that benefit? Post-war, the UK government upped its neck in debt, focused in the 50s on building social housing, infrastructure, broadening access to university, including free university education, which I benefited from, and basic health initiatives, all of which was front and foremost of policies of rebuilding, not just physically, but priorities after a devastating world war. This continued into the 60s, when there was a sense of egalitarianism, part real and part perception only. But we have moved over decades to a society, indeed a UK economy, predicated on consumerism, fuelled by cheap credit, a must-have, throwaway society, which has driven the gap between the haves and the have-nots wider. Post-war, post-pandemic, there are close parallels. UK debt is staggering. We still need social housing, infrastructure, and for too many, the wherewithal for the basics of life and income to provide food and fuel. Food banks in 2021, folk not able to heat their homes, eat or heat, what an indictment on the priorities of successive UK governments, quite indefensible, and ironically accelerated global warming as the detritus of consumerism fills our land and our seas. Growth cannot be simply for growth's sake. The built-in limitations of devolution prevent this institution from radically redirecting the priorities for Scotland's economy. 
There are lessons to be learned from the 50s and 60s, and I should know, because I was there. But the biggest lesson of all is that only as a nation with the economic powers which independence brings, can we in Scotland have that socially just society? Until then, all we can do, whoever is in government here, is mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. We cannot change the direction of Scottish society where it really wants to go. Thank you. I now call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Paul McLennan. Up to four minutes, please, Ms. Glancy. Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I, I say to, to the member who's just spoken previously, when people say to me that I can't do something, I think it's because they can't see our potential. And we have a lot of potential here in Scotland to act, and I urge the government to do all that we can to act to improve the lives of the people in Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, we are now 17 months on from the onset of the pandemic, and with every passing day, the extent of the damage done is becoming clearer. Cases continue to rise again, and it is clear that our fight is not yet over. But it's it's important that we look forward to the future, that the lessons that can be learned from the pandemic are used and the rebuilding job that lies before us is big. For too many people, things were already impossibly hard before the pandemic. Poverty and inequality rife, insecure and precarious work too common, and social care system on its knees. The pandemic has made, of course, all of these things worse. As we look to rebuild, we must use the opportunity we have to harness the innovation that has been necessary this year and build on it to build a better Scotland than the one we had before. To do that, it is vital that we don't just talk the talk on human rights, but put them at the heart of our recovery journey. We have talked in this chamber before about a land of opportunity, and while Scotland is not yet a land of opportunity for all of our fellow citizens, I believe that if we truly make that the focus and the aim of our rebuild, then we can get there. There is a moment in front of us, an unprecedented one, and all of us in this chamber have the opportunity to grasp it and in doing so create the Scotland where we can all enjoy our human rights and live up to our potential. We have all come through the collective trauma of the pandemic, living in lockdowns with restrictions on our freedoms, and none of us liked it. The truth is, though, that people in our country have been living with restrictions on their freedoms for years, and they have been, back, they've been blocked by barriers that we have so far failed to pull down. The poverty and oppression which have left disabled people, women, LGBT people, BAME people struggling to just get by. We came together as a country to fight back against the virus and claim back our freedoms. Now we must come together to fight back against the deep poverty and inequality that is stopping our fellow citizens claiming back theirs. Our vision for the future must be bold, and I support the three aims that the government has set out today. But that means far more needs to be done to help us realise that, that, those aims, and it means ambitious, transformative action. So I welcome that the government has a plan, but I do not, it does not go hard or fast enough. It is not bold enough and it is not ambitious enough. It will not make Scotland the land of opportunity that we all know it can be. Tackling systemic poverty needs sustained progressive action. That's why we've been calling on these benches for the Scottish Government to double the Scottish Child Payment immediately and again next year. Tackling poverty, I will. Christine Graham, briefly, please. I thank the member for taking her intervention. I absolutely share every sentiment she has. But does she accept without full economic power, power over jobs, power over benefits, power over taxation, and borrowing powers, we can't really tackle systemic poverty as a consequence of successive UK governments? Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank, I thank the member for the intervention. Um, I, I don't agree. I'm sorry. I, I actually think we have. Sus sus a number of significant powers that we can use right here today in Scotland to challenge the poverty that numbers of our citizens are facing. We cannot allow our fight against systemic inequalities to go by the wayside either. If we want to begin to tackle those, we have to say equal pay enforced, workplace inequalities addressed and the GRA reformed. And we can improve the lives of thousands of young disabled people by supporting a bill that, that gives them a fighting chance at the future. Progression towards a well-being economy will require more than just words too, and it will require reassuring, ensuring payment of the living wage and procurement and business support, ending zero-hour contracts and closing the disability employment gap. It needs good, well-paid and unionised jobs through investment in areas like care. If we invest in our social care system, 
and that includes paying workers £15 an hour, we can create a person-centred health and social care service that values disabled, people's and, disabled people and workers' human rights and takes the pressure off Scotland's one million unpaid carers. We have an opportunity in front of us to support all those who can get into work and ensure that they are well paid, valued and supported to stay in work. And for those who can't, we build a social security system using all the powers that we have and all the levers that we have to create a minimum income guarantee that no one will fall below. This pandemic has been in the, one of the worst periods Ms. of Duncan any Dancy, of our lives. Please bring your remarks. You've had a bit of extra time for intervention. Please now bring your remarks to close. Thank you. It has provided us with a unique moment for change. Time to step back and look at how the people of Scotland want to live and live up to our full potential. Today, I ask the government to be bold. Don't waste the opportunity you, we have and meet the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now call Paul McLennan uh, to be followed by Ross Cree. Up to four minutes, kind of means up to four minutes, please, Mr McLennan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to speak in the debate this afternoon. I want to focus on, just like Christine Graham, on how we move towards a wellbeing economy. I welcome the publication of the COVID recovery strategy. I think it sets out our priorities as we can recover from the pandemic. It allows us to take a step back and define what this Parliament is all about, what Scotland can be, what Scotland should be, and it sets out our aspirations as a nation. Scotland, for many decades, has systemic inequalities made worse during the pandemic. The strategy, but more important actions outlined, will help us make progress towards a wellbeing economy and move us towards more inclusive, person-centred public services by focusing on improving financial security for low-income households, supporting the wellbeing of children and young people, and fair work. Now, we've heard many comments about how we, how we progress towards a wellbeing economy from all parties in the Chamber since I was elected six months ago. Recently convened the first cross-party group meeting on the wellbeing economy, of which the Wellbeing Alliance are the Secretariat. Open invitation to all MSPs to join us. I've had several fantastic meetings with Catherine Trebek, who was the founder. They've just published a paper, and it's called Failure Demand. And I'm going to quote from the paper here. Of course, governments will always need to be reactive to immediate needs. There will always be unavoidable demands on public spending. That is not in dispute. This report is concerned with demands that are avoidable, damages incurred through economic choices, the purpose and structure of the economy. Only today the OBR stated that the Brexit would have a higher impact, a bigger impact than the pandemic. That was a political choice. And again, quoting from the paper, these are damages that necessitate deployment of our government's financial resources, but which could be avoided in a well-being economy scenario. The report asks the questions, is that the best we can hope for? Is it good enough just to help people survive and cope with the current system? Are payments that allow us to survive all that we should be using our taxes for, rather than investments and configurations that help us to thrive? The research focuses on key interland sectors that illustrate the impact of financial resources of a state directly and indirectly. It finds that in Scotland, and this is due to the existence of low pay alone, the state provided near, nearly £600 million in 1415, £635 million in 1516, nearly £900 million in 2016-17, in 1718-18, and £775 million in 1819 in welfare payments, free schools, and work-related ill health. The report seeks to demonstrate that taking a well-being economy approach also makes financial sense, reducing avoidable demands so that the public spending has a, a longer-term positive impact. The Scottish Government has set out the steps it will take to ensure financial security for low-income families. Rolling out the Scottish Child Payment to children under 16 by end of next year, and doubling it to £20 per week per child as quickly as possible during this parliamentary session. Expanded funding, early learning and childcare for children aged 1 and 2. And designing a wraparound childcare system to provide care before and after school. To improve the well-being of children and young people, the strategy also includes the commitments to at least £500 million over the parliamentary reception to create a whole family well-being fund, shifting to preventive interventions. The Scottish Government is committed to working with its partners in local government, the business community, health services, the third sector and our communities as part of an energetic national recovery endeavour. Presenting officer, in closing, David Hume said, a wise man proportions his beliefs to evidence. Scottish Government is doing so with this strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. Uh, I now call Ross Greer to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I understand why we use the, the language of recovery and rebuilding when discussing our response to the toll that the pandemic's taken our, on our society and economy, but I'm not really convinced that captures what we're trying to do, because I don't think our goal should be a return to what we had in March of 2020. And I think 
Most, if not all of us, agree on that point. The pandemic has had a devastating effect on many people's livelihoods and the financial security of their families. But Scotland and the UK were blighted by the prevalence of insecure contracts and poverty wages before the pandemic. In sectors like hospitality, our ambition absolutely must not be a return to the old normal, which is why growth in trade union membership should be a key indicator of success with these recovery plans. Financial security is, quite rightly, one of the primary objectives of the recovery strategy. And whether it's Unite's hospitality branch or the four rail unions who have won significant victories in recent weeks, there is no doubt that the most effective tool at our disposal for creating a high-wage economy is a strong trade union movement. I'm proud of the actions committed to in the shared policy programme agreed by my party and the Scottish Government, many of which will underpin this recovery strategy. I do apologise, I've only got four minutes and I'm the only speaker for my party. Uh, we're going to triple funding for the STUC's Unions into Schools project, a fantastic initiative which prepares young people for entering the workforce by letting them know their rights and what trade unions can do for them. Uh, on that point, presiding officer, I should refer members to my register of interest, specifically my membership of an STUC-affiliated union. We're also going to expand family income maximisation and other advice services, building on the success of projects like Healthier Welfare Children in Glasgow and the fantastic work of NHS Lothian. These projects will help some of the lowest income and most at-risk families make full use of the social security and other support services which they are entitled to, but which many are not aware of or do not know how to access. And as the Business Minister announced earlier this month, we will use the powers available to us to directly address the issue of low pay. Whilst we cannot yet set minimum wage rates here in Scotland, we will require the many thousands of businesses who receive support from the Scottish Government or provide services via public procurement contracts to pay their staff at least the real living wage. The private sector has received unprecedented public support over the last 18 months for obvious and understandable reasons. But businesses should not expect to receive public money or contracts if they are simultaneously forcing government through the social security system to subsidise the poverty wages they pay their staff. If we are to achieve the objective of good green jobs and fair work, more of this kind of interventionist economic policy will be required. One policy which does not appear in the recovery strategy paper, but which makes for an excellent example of how we will meet its headline objectives, is the introduction of free bus travel for young people. It is not technically a COVID recovery initiative, because we had agreed to do it during budget negotiations in early 2020, before the pandemic hit us, but for obvious reasons, its launch was delayed. Now scheduled for January 31st, this scheme will provide considerable economic, social and environmental benefits. It will expand young people's access to the workforce, simply because it will be easier for them to get to where the jobs or training opportunities are. It will reduce the financial burden for low-income families who are disproportionately reliant on buses, and it will shift more journeys from private cars onto those buses, helping to meet both our climate and local air quality targets. On that point, though, I'd encourage the government to consider how this strategy and its headline objectives align with the national performance framework. I highlighted to the Deputy First Minister a few weeks ago that the MPF contains almost nothing on transport, for example, but a significant shift in transport policy is essential if we're to meet the COVID recovery objectives, our climate targets, and much more besides. So the upcoming review of NPF indicators is an opportunity to better align this framework with the government's strategic priorities. Presiding officer, this recovery cannot mean returning to an economic system which left one in four Scottish children in poverty and which has brought our planet to the brink of catastrophe. This strategy makes for a strong start, but I would encourage colleagues in the government to consider at every stage if they could go further and faster. Given what is at stake, an overly cautious approach would be a far greater threat to our shared objective of a greener, fairer society. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pugh. I, I call Stuart McMillan, who is joining us remotely, to be followed by Douglas Lumsden. Up to four minutes, please, Mr. McMillan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I am pleased to be speaking in this debate and welcome the COVID recovery strategy. It is undeniable that COVID is the greatest challenge of our time, and living with, dealing with, and also the recovery from it has and will provide us with a continual changing policy platform. And, and I state that solely. As a factual point. But like others, I'm sure the MSPs from across the chamber will have heard people say that you know, they're looking forward to life getting back to normal as it was before the pandemic. For me, and certainly from certainly some other MSPs today, recovery must go further than that. And it must go further than how life was before COVID. This COVID recovery strategy will actually help to do that by working with local government, the third sector, and also businesses, large and small. And while the strategy is focused over the next 18 months, it also includes a series of actions over the course of this Parliament to make significant progress towards net zero 
deliver substantial reductions in child poverty and also secure an economic recovery that is fair and green. And those who are already the most disadvantaged have suffered disproportionately. They have been more likely to get seriously ill, more likely to be hospitalised and, sadly, more likely to die from COVID. They have also been the hardest hit socially, educationally and economically by the restrictions that were brought in to control the spread of the virus. And for many people, the disadvantages that they faced have been made worse by the pandemic. Our recovery must be about how we make life better for them. Singh also yesterday I asked the Deputy First Minister about his recent visit to the Bellwell Community Garden Trust in my constituency, and his reply was extremely positive. I know how essential Bellville were to many people, as were other local organisations and MSPs from across the Chamber, will be able to point to examples in their constituencies and regions also. However, it is clear that my constituency went through some particularly stark challenges in the earlier part of the pandemic. The community rallied round. The joint working of all the partners was immense, and we, as a community, are stronger for that joint working. Now, some of the social and economic challenges that my community faced before the pandemic haven't went away, and the recent SDS report indicated that our economy will not fully recover until 2031, which is later than neighbouring local authorities. This is why this strategy is an important first step. A strong, sustainable economy goes hand in hand with a fair and equal society. I am pleased that this understanding will be at the centre of the new 10-year National Strategy for Economic Transformation, which the Scottish Government will publish later this year. I look forward to reading that strategy when it is published. However, some of the actions in this COVID recovery strategy will certainly help my community, such as the investing £200 million in adult upskilling and retraining opportunities to help retrain and reskill workers in areas of the economy particularly impacted by the pandemic and the transition to net zero, also including help low-income families most at risk of experiencing poverty with £8.65 million for the Parental Employability Support Fund in 2021-22, and also at least a further £50 million across 2022-24. We are also rolling out the Scottish Child Payment to children under 16 by the end of 2022 will be hugely beneficial. I could go on, presenting also, because there are many positive examples in this strategy. But saying also, one thing I would like to just say before I finish, I know that this strategy can be helpful for my Greenock and Inverclyde constituency, and I know it will, it will help many, many people. And but it's crucial that the rollout of it, or well, certainly, it has to be done properly uh, for that to happen. And I will certainly, I'm happy to support it, and I will support it, and I'm certainly happy to ensure that many people in my constituency benefit from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr McMillan. I now call uh, Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Jim Fairley. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Lumsden. President officer, um, I refer members to my register of interest, which shows I'm still a member of Aberdeen City Council. Uh, I welcome this debate on COVID recovery, but it's important to acknowledge that those working on our frontline services are still under a huge amount of pressure as a result of COVID. They do not yet feel that they are in recovery phase, nor do they feel that they are being supported or valued by this devolved government. We are all aware of the pressure that care workers and NHS staff are continuing to work under. Hospitals are at capacity, three health boards have support from the British Army, and NHS Grampian have requested support, but wait for that request to be passed on by the Scottish Government. The SNP Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary for Health are failing our sick, our vulnerable and our infirm. And it is only the passion and sheer commitment to public service of our NHS workers that is keeping our hospitals and health boards afloat. And there is little in this recovery strategy that tells us how the government are planning to deal with the recovery within our NHS. Little detail on waiting times or cancer wait treatment times, nothing on a &E waiting times, and nothing on how we are going to tackle the situation of crisis within our ambulance service. NHS boards are telling people not to come to hospital unless it is life-threatening, and the Cabinet Secretary is asking Scots to think twice about calling an ambulance. What are people supposed to do and where are they supposed to turn? The strategy document has some nice words, but after reading the document, I am left with more questions than answers. An example of this is on page four of the strategy. It says it will address the systemic inequalities made worse by COVID. Well, I have been contacted by a family who has a, a son at school and who is deaf. 
and there are over 3,800 deaf children in Scotland. Deafness is not classed as a learning disability, yet a significant attainment gap continues to exist for deaf learners. And the latest Scottish Government data shows that last year, 6.5% of deaf learners left school with no qualifications, compared with 2.4% of all pupils. And 45% obtained hires compared with 59% of all pupils. And the continuation of the use of face masks in our schools disproportionately affects this group of learners and risks increasing the attainment gap that already exists. And I see nothing, nothing in this strategy that tells us how that inequality will be addressed. And I plead with the Cabinet Secretary to look at ways of addressing this issue before more deaf children are left behind. Then, President Officer, please don't laugh, but I nearly fell off my seat when I was reading about partnership working with local government. Of course, this SNP government definition of partnership working with local government is telling them what to do, when to do it, and that's not a partnership. When this devolved government introduced their botched vaccine passport scheme, it was left to local authorities to enforce it. No debate, no discussion, just go and do it. And that's not partnership working. And Aberdeen City Council have been left with a six million hole in their finances due to the devolved Scottish Government delay in payment of money that they asked Aberdeen to distribute to businesses during the pandemic. One million of which has been due since the First Minister imposed an unjustified local lockdown in August 2020. And that is not partnership working. This is an absolute disgrace. And the Cabinet Secretary should be ashamed as this directly impacts on the Council's ability to deliver key services to its communities. The Cabinet Secretary comes today with some warm words, but offers no direct action. Some ideas, but no concrete proposals. Nothing that will help my constituents in Aberdeen, the businesses in the North East, the most vulnerable in our schools and our NHS. Every single group has been let down by this devolved SNP government, despite the UK government ploughing billions into their coffers. We need more than warm words from the Cabinet Secretary to tackle our recovery from this pandemic. We need direct action and we need it now. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. I now call uh, Jim Fairley, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Thank Fairley. you, President Officer. I'm very pleased to be speaking in today's debate, but I have to say, once I had read the Tory amendment to the Scottish Government's motion last night, I did become quite concerned. Not, I hasten to add, because I saw something in there that was uncharacteristically supportive of the Government. Their amendment is predictably negative, lacks the understanding of the reality of what it takes to govern effectively in Scotland's devolved Parliament during a worldwide pandemic, and yet as always, completely fails to recognise the good work the Scottish Government have done, in particular Nicola Sturgeon, in leading us through the pandemic. But it should come as no surprise, of course, because since the election campaign, they made it quite clear that they had no hope or expectation, let alone intention, of trying to win and form a government. So folk may be forgiven for asking, what was their point of standing, if their only objective was to run along the sidelines shouting offside? No, my concern was for my fellow member of the COVID Recovery Committee, Murdo Fraser in whose name this amendment appears. It would appear from the terms of the amendment that he was clearly very confused about which parliament he was a member of, given his demands for the rollout of more fibre optic broadband. Just because the Scottish Government have already invested over £600 million in broadband rollout, it is a reserved matter, and once again, the Scottish Government are mitigating Westminster neglect in Scottish communities. I am pleased to report that when I saw him this morning in the aforementioned COVID recovery committee, he was indeed his usual ebullient self, insightful in his own murder way and very clear of thought. So I have concluded that there was no need to worry about him, he was that he was genuinely confused by lodging this amendment in this, this parliament. It is now clear that he is simply using the old tried and tested Tory trick of failing the Scottish people so abysmally that the Scottish money, government then have to spend hundreds of millions of pounds in mitigating that failing, only for the Tories to then come back and accuse the Scottish government of not doing enough. Now, were I a teacher, were I a teacher, I would be issuing Mr. Fraser with punishment homework tonight and telling him to write out the following 100 lines. Telecommunications is a reserved matter, and we in the Tory party are grateful to the Scottish Government for spending over £600 million to mitigate a UK Government failure to provide properly funded rollout of broadband, and we will stop trying to mislead the Scottish people with these kind of false claims. Now, perhaps, perhaps after... Perhaps after 
Mr Fraser has finished those lines, he will be finished with the hypocrisy of criticising the Scottish Government for sorting out many of the Westminster failings which continue to hurt the people of Scotland. I'll take your interview. Mr Fraser, briefly. Uh, presiding officer, I wonder if I can gently remind Mr Fraley that the, the delivery of broadband services in Scotland is a devolved matter under the responsibility of this Scottish Government. Jim Fairley. Telecommunications is a reserve yeah, matter. Delivery. Officer, I then read the amendment in the name of Daniel Johnson. Whilst I can sympathise to the extent with the intent behind that amendment, it again, as Labour amendments often do, fails to recognise the realities and the constraints of a devolved parliament with a fixed budget. I would urge the Labour benches to look at their continuing depletion of seats in this place and their near extinction in the other place and conclude that if they ever want to be taken seriously as a political force again, that shifting their dial on the democratic right of the people of Scotland to decide their constitutional future might just be the start that they need to change the fortunes of their failing party. However, do not let it be for one second thought that I am trying to give the Labour Party any advice. I am simply saying that Len McCluskey agrees with me. <laughs> Presiding officer, on a more serious note, we have learned some tragic lessons coming through this pandemic, not least of all how incredibly fragile we can be when nature decides to turn on us. That fact should be at the forefront of the minds of every world leader when they attend COP26 over the next fortnight. Now, the Deputy First Minister has already laid out some of the very po positive things that are going to come forward in this uh, strategy. I've got many of my colleagues have also talked about the good things that are coming, and I would endorse all of them. But as we've learned so much about this pandemic. We've also learned bits about ourselves. And when the will is there, we can do things that make things happen at pace and without reservation. Mr Fairley, please bring your marks to conclusion. Rough sleeping was eradicated because we had to do it, so we did. And the Scottish Government's COVID recovery strategy is an excellent start in allowing the people of Scotland to see a new beginning, and I support it in full. Thank you. Thank you. And we now move to winding up speeches. And I call on Alex Riley to wind up for Scottish Labour. Uh, up to five minutes, please, Mr Riley. I thank you, President Officer. The, as I think as Murdo Fraser and Daniel Johnson and a few others have said, the COVID recovery strategy, there's very little that you would disagree with in terms of this. And likewise, the motion put forward in the name of the Deputy First Minister. And that's why we've deliberately put an amendment on to the end of that because we think that it needs to be firmed up and we need some commitments. And I hear uh, Jim Fairley talking about fixed budgets, but in terms of the social care, we have the Health Secretary said to me at the COVID Recovery Committee a few weeks ago that a large amount of the money that is going into the health service will go into health and social care. And as Daniel Johnson rightly said, the, the budget announcements yesterday, regardless of what you think of them, will mean significant more funding coming to Scotland to be able to be prioritised equally into social care. And then the baffling thing for me is that why would you put all those resources into social care and not tackle what is the fundamental problem within social care, which is low pay? I was just scribbling down there that if men were carers, then they would be paid the rate for the job. But as in gender, often point out the majority of carers in Scotland are women and they're paid well below the rate for the job. And so we bring forward this amendment today in all seriousness because we believe that unless you tackle the issue of poor pay and lower pay in social care, then the recruitment and the retention problems that exist within social care are going to continue. Uh, Deputy First Minister. I'm grateful to Mr Rowley for giving way. I, I, I acknowledge the line of argument that Mr Rowley is pursuing, but would he also acknowledge that the government has taken steps in recent weeks in the announcements from the Health Secretary to improve the, the pay of social care workers and it's an issue with which we are actively involved in discussions with our local authority partners. Alex Riley. What I would say is that the steps that have been taken 
while well welcome, are not enough, and we won't tackle this problem. And it will take the Scottish Government to step up and say that they need to introduce a national pay scale for all social care workers. And through doing so, I believe we can start to tackle the recruitment and the retention problems. But it's not just me that says that. The, the Scottish care are among many people who are now singling out low pay and social care as the key issue. And let's think for a moment of the impact that that's having. Because I know in Fife that the waiting list for people who have been assessed in the community is needing a care package but not able to get one. Those waiting lists are going up month by month. Now, these are people that are in the community that if they don't get the support to live in the community, they will eventually end up knocking on the door of the hospital. We then know that there, I think it's 1,500 individuals that are stuck in hospitals right now that cannot get out of hospital. There's no medical reason to be in hospital, but they cannot get out because they cannot get a care package in the community. And as I say, the fundamental, the key issue is that people that are working in social care are not being paid the rate for the job. And we won't be able to recruit and retention will get worse. So I would say to the Deputy First Minister, if you want our support for much that's in here, and you will get that support, you need to look seriously, and the government need to really look seriously at tackling the problem of low pay and not paying people the rate for the job in social care. If we can address that, and we do not have two, three years for a national care strategy or a national care service, that has to be addressed now. Thank you for the additional time, presiding officer. That is the plea, address social care, increase the pay, not because it's desirable to do so, but it's essential if we want to tackle social care issues in this country. Thank you, Mr Riley. And I now call on Sandish Gohani to wind up for the Conservatives. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you. I would like to begin by, my, by summing up by speaking of some of the excellent speeches that we have heard. Uh, my colleague Murdo Fraser speaks of how much of the strategy is new, and I agree that almost nothing is new, uh, but very slightly tweaked. An example of this is the previous target to build 100,000 homes, uh, but that is tweaked to 110,000 homes now. Uh, there was also a lot of debate about patients being asked not to attend A&E unless they are suffering from life-threatening conditions. Uh, the worry is vague symptoms. Having voided yourself after some minor back pain. Now, this isn't life-threatening, but this could be quadriquina, and that is time-sensitive. We must be very careful with what we say, be nuanced, and give clear alternatives. It cannot be self-diagnosis. Daniel Johnson spoke of patients struggling to get their boosters, of course. Deputy First Minister. I'm grateful to Dr Gohani for giving way, because actually, in the words he said there, I couldn't agree with him more, because what he said is what I was saying in my intervention to Mr Fraser. There are alternatives to appearing at uh, accident and emergency that people should pursue that are well advertised, so that it's not self-diagnosis I'm arguing for. I'm arguing for people to be able to use the different alternative routes that are available to avoid presenting at accident and emergency. I wish NHS Lothian Board had said that as well, because that's what I mean about being nuanced and giving out that information. Dan Johnson spoke of patients struggling to get their boosters because of long journeys, something that I've asked the Cabinet Secretary for Health previously about, and patients I know, the most vulnerable in our society, are waiting two or three hours in the cold and the wet to get their boosters. Some arrive to a closed vaccination centre. We must do better. John Mason spoke of truth about ethnic minorities being disadvantaged by COVID. But I do then question why he supports the COVID vaccine scheme, which creates almost a second class of citizen. Those from ethnic minority backgrounds are most sceptical of having vaccines, and the vaccine passport can further entrench their position and prevent them from engaging in normal Scottish life. My colleague Douglas Lumsden makes a point and an important point when he talked about how being deaf has led to a widened attainment gap, and this is simply not good enough in our modern Scotland. Liz Smith spoke eloquently about the importance of a strong economic recovery, and strong economy leads to having money to spend, and having money to spend allows us to fund vital services like our NHS. And a COVID recovery strategy for Scotland should have at its heart 
a credible roadmap that delivers sustained recovery of our NHS. There will be no COVID recovery unless our trusted NHS nurses, paramedics, doctors and support staff are resourced and supported. My colleagues join the medical profession to deliver a world-class public service. They're now at breaking point. According to October's Understanding Scotland survey by the Diffley Partnership, the NHS is our country's most trusted institution. Conversely, the Scottish Government is amongst the least trusted institutions. This untrusted government is failing the NHS and failing families across the country. We know that Scotland's health service was in crisis before the COVID pandemic. Now Scotland's health service is in peril under the watch of this SNP Green government. It's no wonder just six months into a new parliament, trust has hit a rock bottom. Deputy Presiding Officer, on our NHS, we've heard many statements, reassurances, promises of money, but where are the improvements? Where are the innovations? What are the timelines? In this chamber, regardless of our party membership, we would not be doing our job if we do not call this out. Any waiting times continue to fall short of government's own targets. Public Health Scotland stats for this week, uh, ending 17th of October, show 7,000 Scots were left waiting for more than four hours for A&E, 1,786 waiting eight hours, and 515 patients half a day. And this week, Edinburgh's flagship hospital was so overwhelmed, there wasn't a four-hour wait for treatment but 40. Let's also consider ambulance service whose exhausted crews are under sustained pressure, working up to 10 hours without a break. Of course, I'm happy the Cabinet Secretary for Health listened to my proposals to support specialised treatment for those suffering with long COVID. It's a good start. We can even say this is a victory for patients. Mind you, more needs to be done on this front, and I look forward to working constructively with the Scottish Government on this. I would also urge the government to grasp the opportunity as we recover from the pandemic to be bold and innovative in its thinking. In healthcare, we can't just tinker around the edges. Scotland's healthcare needs are growing and we don't have enough staff. We can't conjure staff up uh, and this doesn't matter how much money you pledge to it. We can get staff from overseas, of course, and I understand the UK government is keen to relocate the best global talent in science to our shores. Organisations such as BAPIO uh, provide a fellowship programme for doctors to work here in Scotland uh, that I'm pleased to say the First Minister agreed to look into urgently after I raised this to her. But more doctors are not the only solution. People are the NHS's most valuable asset in terms of cost and skill. So the government should be optimising our use of this valuable resource by changing our system so highly qualified doctors and nurses are not burdened by tasks that can be carried out by other means. And this means redesigning our clinical pathways and deciding how we evaluate and deploy medical technology. I also see little in the way of details of how patients will move through primary care. I propose already in this chamber the government focuses on recruiting anaesthetists as the shortage is causing a bottleneck. I'd like to offer another solution that many GPs will welcome, and that's faster internet. Accessing patient data can be time consuming and we simply do not have time to spare. GP surgery should have ultra-fast broadband. 200 megabits per second should be standard. In conclusion, it is clear we have a long, long way to go in our recovery. We need clear plans for our NHS, our schools, our economy. We need to increase our NHS workforce with a clear plan. We need to act now to future-proof our NHS infrastructure. We need to ensure patients get the help they deserve here in Scotland. And I refer members to my registered interest as a practising doctor. Thank you, Dr. Gohani. And I now call in Patrick Harvey, Minister, to uh, wind up for the Scottish Government. Up to, uh, if you could take us to decision time, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's, uh, it's still a relatively new experience for me to end uh, a debate like this with all of my notes about the members' speeches I'd like to respond to, uh, as well as a speech that's been written for me. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to have time for both. I'm going to have to let someone down, so can I give my apologies to those members I don't mention uh, and to the officials if I don't use all of the words that they've provided for me. Uh, obviously, it's always important at any time, but more so at a time like this as we face recovery from, um, from a historic uh, pandemic, that opposition, in fact, all MSPs, urge the government to go further, to go faster, to be bolder. That's absolutely as it should be. But I was really heartened by the number of speeches today that show that while we may have our differences, many members don't want us to be distracted uh, by those differences, don't want those differences to prevent us from working together where we can, being bold and taking a transformational 
approach uh, at this agenda. Uh, and in, in um, the, the closing speech from, from Labour, from uh, Mr Rowley in particular, uh, I hope and I believe that every member, regardless of political parties, wants us to go further and go faster on the issues that he mentions, including uh, valuing properly the historically undervalued care work in our society that's so, uh, in, in just a moment, that's so critical to us. Uh, he, re he welcomes the work that has been done on that. I welcome the passion he brings uh, and other colleagues bring to the topic. Uh, that topic is best advanced uh, by bringing forward credible, workable and costed proposals for achieving just that. I hope that the Labour Party will do that rather than an uncosted £1.8 billion proposal in an amendment to a debate. But there is work that we will be able to do uh, on that if we choose to work together. Daniel Johnson. W would Mr Harvey accept that it's been costed by his civil servants because I've been in a meeting where they took me through the numbers? So can I ask Mr Harvey, will he support not just the implementation, but it's, just, it's not even as ambitious as that, but just a plan? for implementation of £15 an hour for care workers. Will he vote for it? Minister? I, I, th I think Mr Johnson knows that when we say costed, we mean where the money is coming from, not just where it's going to. Uh, we, we, will, we will aim to work together, but we have a, a budget ahead of us. We have a national care service bill ahead of us, and these are places where we will continue to make progress. But I, w I want to emphasise uh, the, the scale of opportunity that there is to make some of the change, whether it's on uh, financial security for uh, low-income households and the actions the government's taking on public transport costs, as several members mentioned, on school meals, school uniforms, on rent and housing affordability. Uh, and Christine Graham uh, mentioned uh, some of the work that's been done right throughout the, the existence of this parliament uh, on taking a universalist approach on issues like social care and higher education. These are all measures which will help uh, to address affordability and financial security. There's so much more we need to do. But Christine Graham then went on to challenge us all uh, in questioning what we mean by well-being. She challenged us all to be ambitious, to, uh, to, to take the approach that the, the post-war generation did, uh, an opportunity to move beyond uh, what she described as, as today's unsustainable consumerist growth-for-growth's sake economy. That is the scale of ambition that we should have. That's the scale of ambition that we should capture as we seek to build a well-being economy. And Pam Duncan Glancy, uh, in, in what I thought was also a, a, an excellent speech, uh, talked about harnessing the innovation that has been necessary due to COVID and, and described this as an unprecedented moment of opportunity. I agree, and I hope that's a spirit that we can all seek to capture while acknowledging our other differences uh, on many issues. Pam Duncan Glance's description of marginalisation and inequality as a form of lockdown, I think, was, was very important. The, the, rea the reality, the recognition that the freedoms that were lost uh, as a result of COVID or restricted as a result of COVID were not equally shared freedoms in the first place. Uh, and... Um, if we, if, we, if we want to overcome that, we need uh, to do what the government wants to do as its second core objective of COVID recovery, of placing the well-being of children and young people uh, as the priority. Uh, and, and moving on to green jobs, fair work and good green jobs. Uh, a number of members have mentioned this, uh, and in particular, there will be a great deal more work uh, as uh, members know, that the COVID recovery strategy is not a standalone document. It will connect with many others, including uh, the National Strategy for Economic Transformation. And I would reassure my colleague Ross Greer that we are not seeking a return to the old normal. Uh, I think he's right to question whether recovery maybe isn't always the right word, but the National Strategy for Economic Transformation will be focused on just that on transformation and he's right that the review of the national performance framework is another opportunity to address that and there will be aspects of that which I hope cut across the political spectrum. Liz Smith was right for example to raise issues in relation to uh, retail and hospitality sectors and there will be a retail strategy coming uh, as due quite soon and I hope that members across the, the spectrum will engage with that. But it has to be one that recognises that retail and hospitality are industries that have suffered from very, very deep, long-standing problems of poverty wages, uh, of insecure incomes, uh, and of low rates of unionisation. 
And those are the conditions that lead people uh, to have precarious lives, uh, just in the same way that precarious housing does uh, and the actions that the government wants to take uh, in relation to uh, tenants' rights and the rented sector strategy that will be coming soon, hopefully will address, uh, will certainly aim to address these issues of precarious living. Can I, presiding officer, uh, thank those members who have engaged with this uh, debate in a, in a sense of trying to capture that shared moment of opportunity, challenging us as the government absolutely to go further, to go faster and to be bolder. Keep doing that. I, I don't have to urge you to keep doing that. I know that all members will. But this COVID recovery strategy does set out a clear, ambitious vision for Scotland's recovery from the pandemic. Uh, we're going to be focused uh, on the people who've been affected most by the last 18 or so months, increasing financial security for those low-income households, enhancing well-being uh, well of children and young people, and creating good green jobs and fair work. I hope all members across the spectrum share uh, those three goals and want to help the government to go further and to go faster, because central uh, to the recovery from the pandemic is our, government on, our government's focus on a, achieving these three goals, because that's the future that Scotland needs, that's the future that Scotland deserves, and I believe that together uh, we can and will ensure that Scotland can achieve it. Thank you, President. Thank you. That concludes the debate on COVID re recovery strategy. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. Um, point of order, Douglas Lumsden. Thank you, President Officer. Um, on 5th of October, we had a members' debate on big noise Wester Hales. Unfortunately, the Cabinet Secretary for Constitution, External Affairs and Culture, who was meant to be responding to the debate, did not turn up until the last speaker was speaking. He was then encouraged by the Deputy President Officer to watch the debate back and write to all members that took part on the issues raised in their speeches. Beside officer, I have received nothing. Uh, standing Order 7.3.1 states, members shall at all times conduct themselves in a courteous and respectful manner and shall respect the authority of the presiding officer. Firstly, can I ask, through ignoring the advice of the Deputy Presiding Officer to write to members, if Mr Robertson has breached this standing order? And secondly, what your ruling is on the disrespect shown by the Cabinet Secretary to members who wish to debate the issues properly but could not do so due to the lack of his attendance. I thank the member for his point of order um, with regards to the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has not written to Mr Lumsden. Um, I'm certainly sure the Cabinet Secretary will be made aware now that the member hasn't yet received a response and I would hope a response will now follow and I would certainly hope that all members who were taking part in that debate that evening have received such a response. Um, on the second point, the, the chair, who was, the, the presiding officer who was in the chair at the time dealt with the issue um, and received, a res received an apology from the Cabinet Secretary and the Cabinet Secretary made an apology in person at that time to all members who were in the chamber. He has subsequently also written to me and apologised for his error, which is certainly one that I would not want to see repeated again. Um, but the member is absolutely right. At all times, all members of this parliament must treat one another with the greatest courtesy and respect. Thank you. And point of order, Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I wish to raise the point of order about the First Minister's response to my question about NHS Inform's national vaccination booking system. Can I apologise to you for the short notice um, of the point of order? The First Minister told this chamber that it was fixed. My constituents' family were delighted. They phoned NHS Inform this afternoon. The system is still broken. The operator told them not to call back until Sunday, but they didn't know if it would even be fixed by then. The First Minister may want to correct the record to avoid giving misleading information to the Parliament, but can I ask, can somebody in the Government tell us when the system will actually be fixed? I thank Ms Bailey for her point of order. M Ms Bailey will know that the content of members' contributions is not a matter for the Chair, but that a mechanism does exist by which members can correct any inaccurate information that has been shared in the Chamber. Thank you.
No. Oh, sorry, I thought I heard another point of order. Um, the next item of business is consideration of business motion 1847 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a change to next week's business. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion, please press the request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I moved. Thank you, Minister. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 1847 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 1848 on approval of an SSI. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motion. Moved, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, and there are four questions as a result of today's business. The first is that Amendment 1803.2, in the name of Murdo Fraser, which seeks to amend motion 1803 in the name of John Swinney on COVID, strat COVID recovery strategy be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.